the tradition of Middletown, it's just the historical value of the track. You know, the, the trophies won there probably mean a lot more to, to racers than, than the purse, just being able to say I've won at, at that facility. thousands, major events created massive economic insecurities for countless Americans. Hurricane Katrina, the Iraq War, and undoubtedly 9-11 forever changed the world. The aftermath of the September attacks affected so many in the racing community with its close proximity to New York City. These crises touched locally but also had a global impact that reached into the pockets of everyday blue collar citizens. Funding of businesses and stuff like that, extra money around, it, it really impacted a lot of people. It got harder and harder on the race teams to keep on going. You need a roof on your house, you, you know, you put it off for a year or more. <laughs> and you know, racers, are you know predominantly like home builders, uh, landscapers, hands-on kind of people, and that industry slowed down. So the extra money those guys had to spend on racing slowed down. Getting fans to the track was even harder. With new technology and television offering convenience and other alternatives, racing attendance started to fall. The crowds in the stands went to nothing, and I cannot believe how few people are here. It just changed. People changed. The kids just aren't into the car culture. Those that are, are still just as enthusiastic, but the numbers, the percentage of them, uh, things change. In a world of mass production, modern stock cars develop the cookie cutter style, making every small improvement vital to their success. It has become a sport where everybody has the same equipment, everybody has the same motors. So now everybody's trying to tweak the same car to be a little better. And I think it's become tougher for these guys. It's crazy, it really is. And, and if you just go you know, flat out to a company and you just buy that box stock car, it's gonna probably come with 90% of what you need. The other 10%, you've gotta try to find it. Everybody had the same bird cages, same torque arms. Uh, it was all the same. We have to do things we never even thought about doing to gain any advantage at all. You had to be smart about what you did, but you, you had to be a little bit lucky too, because the only way you really test your equipment is if you race. You might have three or four cars, but that person with one car got the same car you got. You know, but he has one. But it took a little bit of the, the game out of it. But uh, it's okay, we just gotta step our game up. Stepping up in the early 2000s were drivers Chuck McKee and Jerry Higby. Both local to Middletown and fan favorites, these hometown guys were tough to beat. And we didn't expect to go out and do what we did in racing. We just went out to have fun. And a local guy out of turn four is going to come on down to grab it. And this grandstand is in rapture as Chuck McKee will take the checkered flag. And it's fortunate when things do go right and we have the success that we did. I started on a pole with Chuck McKee. And I remember they told me, you know what, just do exactly like you did in Brett school. You know, hit your lines, hit your marks. Don't worry about him. If you beat him on the start, just race the racetrack. Here comes Higby! And I was lucky enough to have the race go green to checkers, no yellows. So I was able to, to get away and basically run and hide, just doing exactly the way Brett had instructed at his school. And, and my first win just came so quickly. My Uncle Gary and I were at the diner um, until the next morning when the paper came. And then I read about it. So <laughs> it was neat. Yeah, it was neat. It was that absolutely, it was unbelievable. As the 2000s went on, OCFS saw a changing of the guard with new names making headlines and a wave of young aggressive drivers competing. In the 70s it was the Florida invaders, the 2000s seemed to have some northern invaders. Matt Shepard, Stu Friesen, drivers like that come down here, they're competitive right away. They can dominate a race down here, it raises the whole level of competition. 
2003 Eastern State Sportsman Race, my rookie year in the dirt, the Sportsman Tour. I went down there with my buddies and um, I think we were second quick time and got the lead right away and led every lap. Being a Canadian and, and being kind of an outsider, being able to go down there and win that race was really special. It is going to Stewie, Stewie, Stuart Friesen. Stuart Friesen's driving, he's a whole nother world. Like, I watch him race and it's just like, how can I be like him? It's gonna be Friesen to gain the upper hand on the inside. Friesen yells, na 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 na. I've seen him, I've seen what he can do. I've watched him, I've admired watching him race. Uh, he's an animal and uh, you, you better go as fast as you can for as long as you can. Very aggressive, exciting. And if his car's not good, he's gonna make it good or try to make it work. Sometimes over his head a little bit, but that's what makes it so much fun to watch. He knew he's on his heels at a turn number four this time. He was on thin ice and no, it just, it just worked out good. Shepard got to the inside. Shepard walks by Perigo. Matt Trevor's about winning. He's smooth. He's very intelligent. He works on his own stuff. He's an engineer. So he can adjust it, and he knows what he's looking for. The winner will be Matt Shepard. He does well. I mean, you know, his success has been non-paramounted in the last few years as far, and that's incredible in itself. Bunch of second place finishes, just never won, and then finally, you know, in the springtime, we are able to get that win, kind of get the monkey off our back. Superman is here, Matt Shepard. Shepard, he has a bad qualifying race, can come through. Uh, we've been able to come through sometimes, you know, and we've had bad qualifying. And I mean, I want to beat him every night, and he wants to beat me every night, but other than that, uh, you know, we race hard, and I feel like we both won our fair share. And two guys who called a hard clay home and have had their share of success in the last part of the decade are Brian Crummel and Anthony Perego. Brian Crummel looks a lot like Brett, the way he drives. Anthony Perego looks more like Danny Johnson, willing to let it all hang out. Crummel's a guy, when he's working on that car, he doesn't want you in it. He wants to do it. He wants to know that it's done this way. He wants to know that it's done that way. And he just brings with him a raw talent for being able to get the car prepared and for being able to finish almost every race he starts. Brian Crummel, he's been there for uh, pretty much my whole career. I've raced with Anthony for my whole racing career, and we're extremely competitive together and have phenomenal races. Always a battle with me and him. I mean, even weekly, Saturday nights, you know, you see the 17Z and the 44, they're always near each other. He's made me cry a couple times, you know. He's a threat anywhere he goes. He's got a big heart. Sometimes you can't, you can't beat a big heart, no matter how good you are. On pace to being the new hometown hero, Perego is the guy to watch right now. He's the man at the moment. I don't think he has any fear. He just puts the pedal to the metal, and he's getting up front, and he's going to get there any way he can. He goes bad to the bone. I mean, he's a racer. He's a guy that uh, I think he can win anywhere, any night, and, and is a student of the game. Very talented. You know, they, he's definitely got it figured out. You know, one day you open your eyes and you go, Man, where'd that guy come from? Where'd that guy come from? He's running awfully good, you know, and uh, it happens. But it's not just the guys who have been running really good. There are some fast and furious females to watch, too. Allison Ricky is a fellow competitor and also a teammate. Allison's good. She can drive. She's outstanding. And I love her personality. She's got the walk and she's got the talk. She's got her helmet on. She's, uh, she's, she's going for it. It's, like, incredible to see her go that fast. I'm like, holy cow, look at her go. We definitely treat her like she's a guy on the racetrack. <laughs> It's been refreshing to see the amount that, that she's willing to travel and the amount of time she's willing to put into it. It's been pretty cool. Just okay is not good enough, so that's very cool. You know, she's not out there just to, to go out there and ride around. She's there to be competitive and to win races. I've learned from Jess, like, never give up. And it was cool to see Jess finish 12th at Eastern State. Finished in 12th place, driving a modified at the Eastern States 200. And be the first female to finish high up like that and against all these boys, it's great. We just kind of did the opposite strategy of Stewart. We had the same crew and the same guy. And she ran well. She qualified out of the heat races, uh, got in the show, ran all 200 laps and, and finished 12th. So it was, uh, it was just an awesome day for us. Stu's wife is going to beat him one of these days. Perhaps dirt modified racing is one of the only extreme sports where you can find a 70-year-old veteran competing with a teenage prospect. Only a certain amount of us have been around this long, so it's, it's unique. If you look at how much experience every single driver in that field has, we aren't beginners. There's decades and decades and decades of experience, and if you have less than a decade, you're the exception. The original hometown hero, Brett Hearn, now driving in his 60s, has returned to where it all started, competing every Saturday night, finding his way to the front more often than not. 
I'm so glad he's back. This is his home track. This is where he needs to be. It's an absolute pleasure to have Brett back as a regular at Middletown. If I was a betting man, anytime there's a long race, Brett's the guy. He's very smart. Two weeks ago, we were racing with him, and I mean, he passed me, but if I get beat against the best, you can't really complain, you know? Someone's, you know, creeping up on me. You kind of know it's Brett. Eastern State still runs strong, just as the Goethe family has over decades. But in 2017, the family welcomed one man who has helped give OCFS new life. Chris Larson's doing all the right things to make that place what it should be. From the grandstands to the half-covered grandstands to now the first-turn bleachers to improve sound system, and then, of course, the surface. First year, he did a ice skating rink, hockey rink for the winter. They did a rodeo on it. There's a lot more to the whole fairgrounds other than just the racetrack that a lot of people don't realize goes on here. Look what he's done. It reminded me of back in his 70s when the fair was there. He's brought it alive. He had to have love for the place because that's the only thing that makes sense in what he's doing. He loves the place. He wants to see it succeed. He's going out. He's fixing a lot of things. Racing's a lot better. If you have a good race, fans will come sit on the bucket to watch this race. 100 years pass at OCFS as a testament of time. Standing tall when others have fallen around you. From the drivers who have tested the clay at daring speeds, to the owners who give more than they get. And to the fans who came every Saturday to hear the engines roar. They built memories. They built tradition. They built the legendary House of Power.